Hey there, welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program where we talk to reporters and writers and journalists and uh, all different people who are uh, putting stuff out in the borough of the Bronx. We also talk to photographers and filmmakers and artists. And in our second segment today, we're going to talk to uh, people from one of the foremost photography groups in the Bronx and in the city of New York and FOCO. And uh, we'll do that in our second segment. But right now, let's uh, talk schools and let's bring on uh, a fabulous reporter for Chalkbeat New York. It is uh, Alex Zimmerman. Nice to have you on the Bronx Buzz, Alex. Nice to have you with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, lots to talk about. Obviously, schools are open as we get into uh, the holiday season, and I guess people will be taking a break. You won't take a break, I'm sure, because there's always stuff to <laughs> write about. But let's talk budgets. One of the things that happen is um, we have less enrollment in the schools, and accordingly, I suppose, uh, the city uh, backed off some of the funding for schools. Um, let's um, let's talk a little bit about where we are at. First, um, the um, mayor said he was going to cut the budget, and then all of a sudden now they're restoring some funding. Where are we at as far as funding our public schools in the Bronx and the city of New York? Yeah, so the new administration has argued that, it, uh, you know, thanks to falling enrollment, school budgets need to be brought in line with the number of students who are actually enrolled. And that's a break from the last administration, which used a bunch of federal pandemic relief money um, to sort of plug school budget gaps. So even if your enrollment fell, they were holding schools harmless. They were saying, you know, we understand that this is a really difficult moment for schools. There's lots of, um, you know, pandemic related academic struggles students are dealing with. And so we want schools to have all the resources they can. This administration has said, you know, the federal relief money is one time money and it's time to start dialing back that hold harmless policy. So if a, if a school lost students, um, they should get less money. And so the, the new administration has started phasing that back in. Now, there's a quirk in the process where this DOE every year projects the number of students a school will have and then funds them based on that level. But the number of students who actually show up can be different from that projection. So typically, if you enroll fewer students than you thought you were going to, um, the city will claw money back from you in the middle of the school year. And so, you know, this school year, there was like a lot of drama around that. Like, was the city going to continue that policy, um, which had been suspended during the pandemic? And sort of at the last moment, the um, Adams administration decided that they were not going to cut school budgets mid-year. Um, but that still doesn't mean that still, you know, won't mean that, you know, schools that had their budgets cut um, to account for lower enrollment still wouldn't see budget cuts. There will still be um, many public schools that have. You know, I, I, can, I can see both sides of the issue. I can see certainly you say, well, listen, if you don't have that many students, we've got to back off. I can also see the other argument that says, listen, we know how important school funding is. We know how our kids need every opportunity and every resource they can get. So if the numbers are down, but the money is the same, why not just spend that money and do a little bit better? And I have to add in one of the wrinkles, of course, is, and I don't know exactly what the numbers are, maybe 23,000, how many thousands of uh, students are now in the schools because of the migrant crisis and the number of families that were sent here. And I'm sure you talked to uh, schools that are saying, hey, we're inundated, we're taking care of them, but you got to remember, <laughs> you know, there's a limit to what we can do with the number of teachers we have, the number of staff, the number of books and everything else. Um, right. So um, is, is the news overall good or we still need people like you and your um, colleague, Michael Elson Rooney, to stay on top of it to let us know how we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really good point you raised about the migrant population, which has yeah. really changed the picture somewhat um, in the sense of, you know, there are lots of schools that are that have more students than they anticipated because there are thousands of students who are who have arrived um, sort of since the school year started. Um, the numbers on that are like a little bit hard to pin down because the DOE doesn't ask about immigration status, but, you know, probably talking about in the five to 7,000 student range so far, it's sort of the estimates that city officials- Is, is that the giving. number, you know, I think I, when I was thinking 23,000, that was probably the total number of migrants. And so that would translate into maybe, th thank you for clearing that up. I, I, I misspoke there. Yeah, so it's yeah, about but, 5 yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, did you want to add something else to that? Because if not, I've got the next the next budget Go question. All right. Yeah. Um, specialized high schools. And this is another one where I can see both sides. So they're, they're talking about, um, uh, you know, cuts to specialized high schools. 
on one hand, yes, these are the schools, and and I don't want to say these are the haves versus have-nots because, um, you know, there's a, a wide variety of students that attend. But maybe you back off that because you have a huge homeless population, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, if you've got great schools and you start taking money out of them, what do you think is going to happen to those schools? So I could see both sides. Where are we at with cuts to specialized high schools? Yeah, so that proposal came out of a working group that was assembled to sort of rethink the way that um, school budgets are allocated. And there's a sort of complicated funding formula that determines how much money each school gets that is generally determined on a per student basis. But, you know, there are additional weights for students who are in temporary housing, um, or actually there, there isn't for that, but there there are additional weights for students who are behind um, grade level um, or students with disabilities or English learners. So it's supposed to, it is, and it is a fairly progressive funding formula. So students with higher needs come with more money, but there's this special carve out for about 13 very competitive high schools where they get a little bit more than a thousand dollars. Brogs High School of Science, extra. Brooklyn Tech, High School for American Studies, and on and on and on. Go ahead. I just right. want to So the specialized clear. high schools, but, but plus there are a handful of other schools that the DOE has never really explained why they get this funding oh. boost, but do get a funding boost. I, I, um, I, wow. <laughs> Um, so there's like a little bit of a black box element to that. Um, but anyway, there's this funding group um, and, and, you know, it should be this funding group has basically said one way of, you know, reallocating funding in a way that might be um, beneficial to more high need students would be to eliminate the um, special bonus that comes with students who attend these hand, you know, handful of very selective schools. As I um, said, I can the- see both sides of that. That is that. I, I, I understand it. On the other hand, if, if we don't fund the students who are having a hard time in the lower grades, they're never going to get to the specialized high school. Right. And then there's a whole broader debate, right, about whether, you know, all school budgets or, or the school funding formula should essentially keep, should only add money, right? So instead of like cutting from one set of schools to help out another set of schools that um, have a lo- you know, large high need populations. Um, like, should we essentially hold schools harmless and only add additional money um, for different student groups? And so, you know, this this school funding group didn't exactly reach a conclusion on that. It's going to be up to the mayor and the school's chancellor what to do with those recommendations. But overall, the recommendations were mostly designed to disproportionately help schools that serve higher need high need student students. populations. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's a difficult um, question. Another thing that has come up and it raised my eyebrows, I attended um, way back when um, an independent um, a, a pre-K school, an independent nursery school. And they were, com- this I thought was remarkable, of course, dealing with the DOE over the years and the Board of Ed, um, nothing should surprise you. But there has always been this competition between the independent nursery schools, maybe from a community center or, or, or you know, another group that funds a, um, a, a, a preschool and the DOE's uh, uh, preschools. And now the people in the independent schools are saying, hey, where's our funding? That's that's, you know, the kids are all the same. It's it's not like one right. should get and one should not get. Um, but now, as I understand, um, they, I guess uh, pre-K kind of uh, they won the battle and they're finally going to get the monies that they do. Do I have we'll that right? See. We'll, we'll see, see, I think. Um, I mean, so <laughs> I'm trying. you're right. The, yeah, the early the early childhood education landscape is really complicated. There are some students who are served and sort of Department of Education schools and buildings, but actually many um, students are served through these uh, community-based organizations, these nonprofit private providers that have contracts with the city. Um, And that was one way that the prior administration was able to achieve universal pre-K for four-year-olds and a big expansion of pre-K for three-year-olds was relying on these private nonprofit groups. And so they have all these contracts with the city and there have been these it seems like the problems have intensified recently in terms of the city's ability to pay those providers on time. Um, and so that has been like a huge controversy. Um, and, you know, right now, you know, as of the end of last fiscal year, those providers were owed about $140 million from the city. Um, and so the city recently announced <laughs> oh, that it, you know, it was going to try to 100, speed up. This, you know, yeah, it's just a lot. Of, that's a lot of money. 
and and you think about all the teachers and that they and and not for profits uh, who we in the Bronx rely on a, a lot, uh, community based organizations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, wh- what are they supposed to do? I mean, right. So that's a a big problem, and um, it can have big implications in terms of your ability to keep your doors open, which in turn has implications for you know whether there are enough seats available to serve all of the students who. Um, need a pre-k seat and so let, let's just play that out let's just say which we would never want to see that some of these schools would have to then close those children will then go to uh, presumably you know doe based uh, uh, you know pre-k etc cetera, etc cetera. you're going to have to fund them anyway <laughs> you know what i mean so uh, i i mean i'm uh, and and is it, you, the your story was new york city now vows to pay those pre-k providers so you think that money will 140 million will be forthcoming yeah i think that's what the doe is promising i think we'll see how quickly that comes through um you know payment issues to these providers is is not a new issue um it's been an issue in the past as well um but it the scope and scale of this seems to be worse than it has in the past um and yeah it just has real implications for the sector's ability to provide pre-k seats um, we only got about a, a minute or so left i just want to ask you the the mood in the um, state legislature is to raise the cap on charter schools for the uh, people coming into office beginning in january that seems to be the trend um and uh, i believe i saw something um in chalkbeat that uh, charter schools now are showing greater enrollment do you think um in, in, again we just have a short amount of time do you think that we're going to be um, licensing more charter schools and then those are going to be becoming more popular over time i mean we'll see it's it's it was interesting that kathy hochel sort of in the final moments of uh her gubernatorial race decided to come out in favor of raising the charter cap i think it'll probably be an uphill battle in the state legislature um i, I would you know I, i'm not sure it's All a right. sure thing that they would raise the cap so, so this is what we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to watch what happens. And then when we have some idea, we'll call Alex Zimmerman back from Chalkbeat and say, so now where are we at? Listen, Alex, your work is so important to all of us. And the folks at Chalkbeat New York are just doing a fantastic job. There's nothing more important than educating our children. And um, second to that is the people who report on it. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Any Anytime. Thanks for having me. All right. We're going to take a short break and then change gears and it'll be Enfoco. We're going to go to take pictures. We'll be right back. 